Hi, uh, this is uh, Dr. Stephen Bennett. I am uh, here to talk with you about uh, my companies, Prescott Logic and Prescott Logic Technologies. I'm here on behalf of our newest partner, Helmco, as Christos walks out the door. Um, and uh, very grateful to be here. So thank you for, for showing up. I think given the number of people that's in the room, I'll probably turn this more to a conversation if you have questions sooner than later. Um, but at that, let me run through uh, a little bit about our company. So I'll run through, I'll touch lightly upon a few things as I go through this for continuity. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about anything afterwards and, and you know, blow it out a little bit. But I want to give you a little bit about our company, just touch upon the biochemistry, of course talk about processing, talk about products, we're product development experts, we start there. Um, I'll get in a little bit to research and the advantages that we have and move on. So <clears throat> Prescott Logic, uh, which is in the States, Sorry. Prescott Logic, which is in the States, that's why I asked if I didn't have to use it, uh, and Prescott Logic Technologies, uh, located in Canada, uh, we have a little bit of a different approach. Uh, we are collectively a group of scientists and doctors. Uh, we believe in the healing power, but we know it doesn't cure everything. We're very interested in the, the mechanistic science behind the cannabinoids, some of the other components, um, and we focus on what we call bench to clinic research. So from tissue culture to translational mouse models or animal models into preclinical and clinical. Uh, and that has been you know, our approach. So we're, we, we focus on, on human disease and we focus on the full deconstruction, which is the processing that we'll, we'll discuss, and then the reconstruction, which is the mindful reformulation and the validation therein. So we offer uh, a range of services, at, actually. Some of them are a little bit harder to package than others. Um, consulting from applications to facility build-outs to IP evaluation to training on equipment and, and finally getting to products. Um, we work with a lot of manufacturers and we produce our own line of white film distillation uh, equipment with our partner Pilotist out of Germany. These are uh, units that I'll get into a little bit that are, I, I would call cannabis innovative by being at the, at the helm, so to speak, I've, I've worked out a lot of the problems that some of my competitors have to make these units a lot more efficient. We'll talk a little bit about formulations and some of the things that we, that we do. So we have a, a pretty fast growing footprint. Uh, these are all equity positions. Um, sorry, on the left side, these are our partners <coughs> on, the, on the European side. But basically, <coughs> we have no limits, we have other regions that we're getting into, um, and you know it's it's a huge industry. So this is all about eight months of of of, of, of acquisition. So the market, uh, you've probably all heard a lot of different figures about the market. This one was a more recent figure. It's a little bit lower. We've heard two two hundred billion by 2020. Um, and just to cover a little bit about how these these statistics can be generated. The way that this particular figure is calculated is about the, the size of the adult population that could potentially purchase cannabis. So what, it, you know, what the actual annual growth rate turns out to be, you know, we're in the hundreds of billions one way or the other. So just to touch upon you know, what, what are the molecules that, that we're going after, right? We talk about crude extracts, we talk about isolates, so I would say primarily we're talking about cannabinoids and terpenes and terpenoids. Um, flavonoids, on the other hand, are under investigation. Everything is being studied with cannabis, without cannabis, and cannabis just happens to have a collection of a lot of molecules that we need to find a lot of information about. Um, so currently there's about 113 cannabinoids. There's about 15 flavonoids that have been identified. Two are specific to cannabis. Um, and a, a few hundred uh, terpenes and terpenoids, again, some specific to cannabis. Uh, all of these molecules are derived from the, uh, the same or similar biosynthetic cascade. So really when you look at the molecules in, in, in two dimensions, but you, you can start to see how a terpene would be, uh, could be a partial of a cannabinoid. And I'm not gonna present it now, but I have hands-on research that shows that terpenes absolutely are negative and al positive allosteric modulators 
of cannabinoids. That's to say that they influence the way that the cells bind THC and CBD and respond. Um, these are very, or I should say not very, but relatively stable, right? You can extract cannabinoids as API, active pharmaceutical ingredients. You can put them on the shelf. Uh, they'll be good for quite some time. THC will convert to CBN over time, uh, but they're relatively stable. Um, terpenes and terpenoids are the exact opposite. Uh, we like to call it the, the strain's personality, uh, but all of the aromas, the tastes that we associate with it that have an effect, that personality is all that terpene pool uh, that we can take off the plant. I'll get back to you. Uh, some of these, I, I realized before, got, and flavonoids misspelled, so apologize for that. Uh, someone will get fired. Um, this, some of these got moved around, but it's completely fine by me. Th these are the kinds of things that I, I'm not particularly fond of. Uh, they're a little misleading. Uh, I go back into the primary literature, the actual articles, You'll find that a lot of this is done with synthetic cannabinoids, if not most of the research. You'll find that they're performed at, at non-physiological doses. Um, if you're familiar with linalool, uh, linalool is a uh, compound found in lavender. It's a, it's a terpene. And uh, I read a, a paper that mice were injected IP intraperitoneal with 1,200 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, that's like me coming up with a... a two liter of soda and a knife on the end and jabbing it into your stomach, if it's, it's just not relevant. So in as much as I know that, that there are uh, positive effects, you know, I think that there are groups that I won't mention that do very good jobs of making things colorful and, and try to you know, tell you it's going to cure everything, and that's just not the case. Uh, the, this bone stimulant should actually be over on CBD. This is a, some recent work that shows that osteogenesis, that's the formation of new bone cells, is, is induced by C, CBD. So yes, it has a lot of effects. Some of these are anecdotal. Some of these are more mechanistically shown. Um, but lots to be done. I won't get into this too much. Somebody else probably will, but you know, what's very unique about cannabis is it's foreign to, to us, and it's a new industry. But we have literally co-evolved with this plant. So the, um, the plant produces you know, terpenes, cannabinoids. And unlike ethanol, if we drink alcohol, which just indiscriminately will get you intoxicated, uh, there's a very intricate system called the endocannabinoid system. Um, in, a, in a very sort of rudimentary way, um, and this is, this is uh, not absolute, there are um, there's a good distribution of these receptors. But typically, CB1 receptors are associated classically with the synapse, and it, it actually dampens um, a strong synaptic signal. Uh, this would be attributed to psychoactivity as well. Uh, CB2 um, are found predominantly in peripheral tissues. This is a, a white blood cell as an example. Um, typically, it's involved with uh, reducing inflammation when these are activated. Something I want to go back to. So something that's really important, and it really it's sort of fresh on my mind here, because there's 113 cannabinoids, right? CBD is the one that obviously we're focused on here. Uh, in North America, THC is more accepted, which will happen here eventually. Uh, but the reality is, is that THC is, a, is what's called an agonist. It's a direct activator of the receptor. CBD is an, a reverse agonist or an antagonist. It has the exact opposite effect on the receptor. So when we're talking about CBD-only therapies, from a pharmacological standpoint, there's a lot to be, to be told there. So, um, that, and to confound things more, these receptors are not the only things that the cannabinoids interact with. Um, CBD, for example, is an agonist. That is to say, it activates dopamine D2A receptors. Uh, it activates mu, kappa, delta opiate receptors. So there is a lot of overlap with these systems. And these receptors are not just arbitrary. They're the, in the same exact class as opiate receptors. And actually, from a pain standpoint, uh, the receptors co-localize in, in instances or even form what I'd call a super receptor, portions of an, of an opiate receptor, portions of a cannabinoid receptor. Huge mechanistic understanding for pain. So. The thick of what we're here to discuss, of course, is, is processing, right? How do we get all these molecules? Um, and I'll get into these in some detail. So we offer 
uh, similar to, to Helen Co. Uh, in North America, we offer turnkey solutions. So this is complete solutions at any scale from what we call plant to product. Um, some of these are, are partnerships, as I indicated, with, um, with, with other manufacturers. Um, but at the end of the day, we are, we are here to empower our customers. We are here to explain the technology and train on the technology, not simply put an invoice in front, make a sale. That's not how we operate. And there's not a one size fits all. So if, if everybody here said they wanted an extractor and I recommended the same one to everybody, it would be pretty obvious. Uh, so the reality is, is that there's a lot of ways to go about it or to skin the cat, so to speak. And I feel it's my responsibility or the company's responsibility to educate the customers show them their alternatives, give them the pros and cons, and help them make decisions rather than just run the show for them. Um, so extraction, uh, and I know that there's going to be a range of familiarity with these topics. Um, I'll cover in some more detail, but first we need, whether it's mechanical or solvent-based, we need a way to get the material we want out of the, the raffinate, once it's empty, but the plant material. Following extraction, the material has a large amount, especially hemp, a huge amount of lipids, waxes. Um, I wouldn't call them impurities. I wouldn't call them pointless, but things that, that make processing a little bit challenging that need to be removed. So adding between 5 and 10 volumes of ice cold ethanol, letting that sit for 24 to 48 hours, quickly filtering it um, to recover the, the ethanol uh, oil, and then putting that in like a, a rotary evaporator is one example to, to recover the ethanol and have your refined oil. At that point, if you haven't done it already, you have to activate the material, uh, which is just through heat and decarboxylation. Uh, that releases about 13% of the mass, which is relevant because when you're distilling, you can't have that CO2 vapor load. It will, will crush the system. So decarbing is a critical aspect that has to be done. Some groups will decarb their, their, their flour prior to extraction, and that's something we can get into. So fractional distillation is simply thermal separation. Uh, it's using heat to separate molecules. If you think of uh, a classic ethanol and water uh, mixed together on a pot, if you heat that pot to 90 degrees, you get the ethanol to release and the water stays behind. So fractional distillation, a more intricate system, but the premise is the exact same. Once you have this, this distillate, which is a, a cannabinoid-rich fraction, upwards of 97% of all of the cannabinoids, uh, from there, if you want to derive isolates, you would then go to preparative chromatography to separate the, the molecules within the distillate. So this is not just cannabis processing. This is pharmaceutical processing, and you know, it's, uh, it's not something new. So as far as, as, far as extraction techniques, um, again, there's pros and cons to, to all of these, and this isn't comprehensive. We have, uh, obviously, the probably the most common are CO2 and ethanol, and I've listed them up here. I won't go through them all, but there are <coughs> clear advantages to using CO2, and I would say, quite simply, CO2 equals terpenes. Getting the terpenes off with CO2, absolutely the easiest way to do it. At that point, I'm pretty agnostic. In fact, you can consider this, if a, if a CO2 reactor is going to run for four hours and in 30 minutes you can remove your terpenes, is it worth three and a half more hours to run that machine or is it better to rinse it for five seconds with, with ethanol, which will get everything out as well. So again, working with people on, on uh, getting the, the, the proper extraction technique or suite of extraction techniques. There's a business case for ethanol, there's a business case for CO2, I won't get into it now. Um, mechanical, I put up here, rosin presses, these are appealing when regulatory oversight is not comfortable with some of the chemicals that are being used, so simply squeezing the grape, so to speak. Hydrocarbon, I don't get the feeling that butane and propane is something that's big here yet. Anybody? No? So, or at least in the legal markets. Um, but this is something that, you know, a lot of these extraction techniques exist because they were available to people, right? So getting CO2 in bulk, getting ethanol in bulk, getting butane in bulk, very easy. Uh, pentane and heptane work much, much better, but they're harder to procure. Um, but at the end of the day, the hydrocarbon really confers a, uh, of, uh, an accurate representation of the, pla the plant. The concentrate has the terpenes, has the cannabinoids, and it's very much a connoisseur product. So with distillation, 
I started to cover, we have, you know, the classical single solvent recovery, rotary evaporation, long path length, you know, ethanol is a relatively small molecule. So with wiped film distillation, this is a, a, a system that, it, that, that allows you to remove the thermally labile compounds, in this case cannabinoids, because vacuum and heat are inversely related. So the, the higher the vacuum, the less heat that you would need to distill, so you actually protect the cannabinoids. So distillation is distillation. These are just a couple different subcategories. Um, I'm going to skip that one, actually. So, and then I mentioned the last is, is preparative chromatography, and there's a few options for that as well. So preparative chromatography is simply the sep chromatography is the separation of molecules. Uh, traditionally, this would be done in um, a, a column with maybe C18, maybe silica, uh, and basically you are, you are running your sample through. It'll disperse in a way um, in the column, and then you elute that with known solvents of different polarity, collect those fractions. Um, so the three, uh, standard sort of reverse phase, uh, centrifugal or CPC, this is the rotochrome technology, um, and then supercritical. So the advantages to centrifugal uh, partitioning from what I've been told is that you are able to run crude oil, uh, not distill first and clean it up, you're able to run it through. In practical purposes, uh, that slows the, the system down considerably. Moreover, in both reverse phase and uh, centrifugal, you are using acetonitrile, acetic acid, methanol, ethanol, isopropyl. So you're, you are creating a huge amount of chemical waste. It is not a, a neither are green technology, so to speak. Supercritical fluid chromatography, on the other hand, using carbon dioxide is a very green technology. And this equipment, um, Thar Process is, is a partner as well. Um, they are very heavy CapEx expenses, however, with this, you'll get in in the morning, you'll turn the machine on, it'll be producing the isolates you want all day, you can set it, forget it. With these, you need to hire chemists. So just things to, to weigh out. Um, I won't get too into depth in analytical, but that's something else that I, I strongly urge people to be on top of. Um, even though you will be required to have third party testing before a, a human being can consume a product, it's advisable to work with your testing company to method develop so that what you do in-house is the same thing they do, allowing you to package at risk, allowing you to just not have to be at the mercy of these third-party testing. At a minimum, I would say anybody that's doing any processing needs an HPLC so they can determine the potency at any point in the process. So, something to think about. So, when we, when we put labs together for people, a lab to me could be a five liter CO2 extractor in a closet, or it could be a full-blown academic research lab. So we, we work with, with, with the full spectrum uh, on putting that together. So I mentioned before that we are product development experts. So that's really you know, where my story started. Um, and again, not going through it. So at the end of the day, there's several different starting materials that are, that are coming out. You can fractionate with CO2 to get the terpene fraction, to get a wax fraction, to get what they call a light fraction or cannabinoid fraction. You can use the fractional distillation to further fractionate things down um, to maximize the amount of materials that you can work with. If you, uh, people say, well, why not ethanol? Okay, well, ethanol is going to take out a portion of your terpenes, okay? So that said, if people want to compete in the vape pen market and they've destroyed a good por portion of their terpenes, it's a, it's a problem. So really working backwards from a product assortment to get the right equipment in place and be mindful about that is where we come from. I started to talk about distillate advantages. Again, it's stable, it's consistent. Distillation is the first step of standardization, right? So you've heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. That is to say that an extracted oil can be no better than the material that it was derived from. Much different in this case, because we're able to take that 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 batch-to-batch uh, -batch variability and literally distill it down to what we're interested in, and it turns quality into quantity. And you can literally see the amount that you get more out from the uh, more potent material. Um, so that said, people are on the hunt for isolate, and I think that's great. But to go back to the product mix, if you want to make vape pens and you only have isolate, 
you're going to be using propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, something to cut that with. So there's oil fractions from the same plant that we've used to cut the, to cut the pens with so you have a, a cannabis-only ingredient label. So cannabis sativa. I realize that this is a, a hemp country and we have, we have cannabis in, in North America. Hopefully everyone knows it is the same plant, right? It is all cannabis sativa. Uh, a species is defined by an interbreeding population. We all know that if you put hemp and cannabis next to each other, they're going to cross-pollinate, and that's a problem. So they are the same species. The potency, I know the limit here is 0.2%, but the hemp market is defined by 03 which to me is just as arbitrary. It was established in 1971 by a Canadian scientist that said hemp is less than 0.3. So um, I talked about the high wax content. Uh, at the end of the day, we're talking about much larger scale uh, with hemp. And you know, really what we're talking about is what you have here, what we have in North America are completely different industries. Here, this is an agricultural product, hemp, whereas in North America, we have cannabis as a therapeutic or a medical or a recreational, so we have completely different designations for this. So I mentioned how, how, we, how we work with groups, and we start with products. We start backwards. We don't insist that you buy equipment and press start and get rich. Um, we want to know what your vision is. We want to know who your partners are. And you know, we want to mindfully get the right product mix. From there, we get the right manufacturing equipment for those products, simple enough. More importantly, we get the right scale of processing equipment. And then, once you have all of that in place, you really have a lot of power over your cultivation. I talk to, to cultivators now about cannabinoids. I don't care if it's this strain or that anymore, I'm a processor. Um, so I have groups that have 8% THCV strains. Those are viable for processing to purify THCV. Without the, without the right genetics, you can't make the processing efficient. A fraction of a percent, you're not going to purify it. But the idea is, is that, let's just say hypothetically, your product assortment was 50% capsules. OK, number one, terpenes would be uh, unwise to put in a capsule. They can react with the capsule. They can explode in shipment. We've all heard these stories. So moreover, once we're getting down to the molecule of THC and CBD, to keep it simple, maybe just CBD, um, do you need to put massive effort into the entire cultivation? And the answer would be no. You could probably put a little less attention on the, the plants that are going in for capsules. It's really going to be the vape pens, the connoisseur products, the, the, the dry flower that you're really going to want to invest a lot of energy in. That could be 25% of your business, could be 50, could be all of it. Um, but at the end of the day, when you have processing dialed in, you can mindfully re-strategize everything in the entire business, and that's something we can get back to. Um, so I mentioned this, right? We, we have um, product designations in, the, in, in North America of this medical and recreational. I don't like the word recreational. I think it should be switched with adult use or general use. Um, because at the end of the day, if you have a bad day and have anxiety and cannabis makes you feel better, I don't think you need to go to your medical doctor and get a diagnosis for anxiety disorder. Uh, but that's, that's how, in, in North America, these are currently being designated. This is an emerging, <clears throat> an emerging trend, is lifestyle, right? You can't drink and run, but certainly people use cannabis, run, lift weights. Um, people, <clears throat> people don't traditionally view, I got to be very careful here. People are, 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 are viewing cannabis less as a drug and more of a lifestyle, more of a decision. Um, it's very hard to determine with a given individual what would be true medical, what would be, you know, recreational, for lack of a better word. So we, we get into some, some, some treacherous areas, and, and I submit that the products are, dictate the designation. I, I, you know, I'll get to those. I make patches. I make capsules. I guarantee you no one's going to strap 10 patches on themselves. It's just not, not a feasible thing. So the products really are dictate how they're being used. So we've made every product under the sun, um, every kind of salve, lotion. Uh, I developed a patch in 2014 that we still have, um, oral mucosal sprays, award-winning vape pens, again, the cannabis only. 
um, press tablets, meter dose inhalers, beverages. That's a big one. There's a couple out there now. Uh, I work with some pretty large beverage deals in Canada. Uh, dry formulations like K-cups and uh, maltodextrin additives, different types of raw extracts. But this is where I would normally, if anybody needed consulting help, I'd start here, kind of products, and work backwards. It's, it's, it should go that way, just like your sales should drive your production process. So I'll touch upon research, because I'm an academic scientist, and it is very important. And I think that this is kind of depicts my thinking pretty well. And, you know, the fun thing as a scientist about cannabis is that, you know, I've been in the top situation my whole life, right? And so this is a perfect example of what we call a high throughput screen. These are libraries of molecules, right, just <coughs> stacked up that you can buy from, in my case, the NIH. And um, you have a, a high throughput screen, maybe a 96 or 384 well plate. You slide these compounds down, and you see a couple of them are positive, right? They're, they're non-validated hits. So then you take those, those further, and you, with, with more rigorous experimentation, determine if they are validated. And from there, you start to work towards a drug. So the classic 10 years, a billion dollars for a pharmaceutical, it's not a joke. Cannabis has some advantages, certainly some disadvantages too, more legal. Um, we know it's safe, so we really are not, are not searching. We, we know that these are hits. We know that there's physiological activity. Um, so we're really starting at a much earlier place. Um, and the difference, of course, being that we're talking about one formulation versus a single drug. But the reality is, is that this can be streamlined. Phase one pretty much can be obviated. So, you know, kind of my gripe on what, what people call cannabis science, right? So a lot of what is going on with cannabis science are clinical trials. And the idea that this is backwards really makes no sense to me. Um, you generally don't have doctors arranging groups of people and giving them different pills. That's usually done for them when, when they get there. So what, what I'm seeing and what's pretty much pandemic is, is you know, people want to want to be valid. They want to prove that, 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 that this is a valid uh, thing to do. So they jump right to clinical trials, right? And then when you talk to the, the doctors that organize these, you say, well, what did they take? How did they take it? How much? And they shrug their shoulders. So the idea of doing a clinical trial with a plant as a biochemist just doesn't make any sense. So again, there's no mechanism. Even if it worked, even if, if you gave weed, pardon my French, to somebody and said, and, and they said, oh, cured Alzheimer's. Okay, we still have to figure out how. So, you know, I, I don't think that it's, it's worthwhile to simply jump into human beings. We're very complex. We're taking other medications. We've got gender differences, something called pharmacogenomics. There's a, 200, a, a potential 200-fold difference between how I metabolize drugs in general, over-the-counter otherwise, and somebody else. And that's why we see such disparate effects from person to person with, these, with cannabis products. Um, so this is more the, the mechanistic um, approach. Again, bench to clinic. We see how things act at the receptors. We see wh what goes on in the cell. We then translate that to full organisms, usually mice and rats, verify that at a full organism, that that's still occurring, and then we start preclinical and clinical trials. So is this the route for everybody? No, but for the, for the groups that are interested in being in selling valid products, scientifically valid, validated products, this is the only way to go. So how do we do this, right? I'm, I'm out selling equipment. Um, we have a very big academic push, and that's, that's something that, that I can't stress enough. Business people get very anxious that intellectual property is going to be shared with the university. I say the, the university lends credibility right away. They have legal departments to handle all the IP. Uh, moreover, they have, everybody is in their swim lane. So instead of $1.5 million for a clinical trial of, on 20 people, I'm talking more about $25,000 seed grants in six different diseases for a tenth of the price. And you really, we're talking about publishable results, we're not talking about, um, anyway. So the, this is a very real path, and this is, I'm very biased as a scientist, but it, it's going to science. Good or bad, there's no other way 
for us to keep innovating products than to break it down, see how they work, see how they work together, or how they don't. So it's a little reiterative, but, but again, just, you know, my background is, is Alzheimer's disease and Lou Gehrig's. I also uh, did a few years of uh, postdoctoral work in opiate receptors and also melanoma. Very diverse background, so this isn't an arbitrary just pick a disease and let's go for it. These are people I have in place that are very skilled at their science. Um, and this allows people with mission and vision, hey, I really want to make a difference to plug into, right? You can be a part of, of, of the bigger process. So at the end of the day, uh, the picture of this is, is downstairs as well at the, at the Helen Co. booth. Uh, this is a picture of the Prescott 500 white film distillation. I would like nothing more than to have one of these running for everybody here, um, but I was lucky to make it. So we, <clears throat> I can't stress it enough, we are cannabis innovative. This is a German partner. If anyone buys a machine and wants something different on it on the spot, we can design it that way. I've worked with this equipment for so long that I've know, I know all of the problems, and literally this system hums along at double the rate of my closest competitor at performance I have literally not seen. And truthfully, we want it to be the best, so someone buys a machine and says, oh, I don't really like this, we will fix it. So, you know, Pelham Co., of course, is, is the purpose of the visit um, today, uh, but we are amassing a very large network of people. And, and again, a lot of these are competitors with each other. We're, we're not looking to make points on selling equipment. We, we offer the other equipment besides distillation more as a service to our clients. And a lot of the manufacturers, some are sitting in this room, we have reciprocal relationships. So it's not all about squeezing the customer for money. But, and then of course the academic partners on the bottom, that's gonna be a growing list. At that, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Yes. You're very welcome. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the unit economics? So, like, two, two sort of sub-questions there. Sure. What so, sort of margin do you see on a kilo of, uh, or, I mean, whatever unit you think is fair? And understanding there are tons of variables that will go into yeah, what affects that margin. It's, it's a great question. Though. And the, <clears throat> the second one is, to my understanding, there's very little processing uh, capacity in Greece right now, and a lot of what gets made here gets exported abroad. So to someone that was thinking about going into this part of the market, what competitive advantage would I have over, you know, a scale Swiss processor if I were to buy your equipment, let's say? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, as, as someone who knows all of this, I, I really would think that, that, that more people uh, would be knowledgeable, and you might be quite knowledgeable. Um, you know, the... Uh, let me go back to your first question first about the, the, the metrics. So, so first and foremost, I'll, I'll use Canada as an example, right? Um, you can buy isolate, CBD isolate, costs between six and eight thousand dollars a kilogram, okay? And again, with the problems of what are you going to do with it? If you have a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing group, fantastic, you have the right starting material. If you want to make vape pens, guess what? You don't. Um, so right now in Canada, crude oil is about ten dollars a gram. Distilled, distilled material is about $25 a gram. This is you know, wholesale prices. And then the difference from distillate to isolate is pretty much non-existent. So you're going to put a half million dollar piece of equipment to make isolate, and it's not going to be more valuable proportionately. So that's something. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but at the end of the day, the, va the variables you're talking about are the potency, the starting potency, those kinds of things. Um, but the competitive advantage that you would have with distillation in general is that you have a consistent starting material. So irrespective of the pharmacogenomics, you can, you can be assured that the same person is going to get the same product and have the same experience. So that's really the purpose of it. Um, on the flip side, I could say these are techniques that have been around for quite a long time, right? And, you know, at some point in time, everybody will have a rendition of that, that platform. What you have here is speed to market. Um, first mover advantage, that stuff that, you know, we don't have anymore in North America. So, um, moreover, Canada, 
uh, I don't know a single group in Canada that is doing much other than a pilot preparative chromatography unit, pilot distillation unit. I've just been amazed to see that people aren't at the full level of processing. Um, so that's that question. Um, I, let, me, let me get back to you on the other one. Yes. Presentation. And um, my question is, I know a long time ago uh, Americans liked the grass. How is the progress today with regards to accepting the pharmaceutical, um, uh, pharmaceutical characteristics of the, of the cannabis? And the second question is, um, what about the medical world? How is the progress uh, about making prescriptions for sure. the people? Okay. Sure. So because that will uh, affect the demand for the products, right? Correct. So I, would, I, would, I would argue yeah. that the formulations have to be exacting and in place before a prescription could be written, right? It needs to resemble more of what a doctor would write than a plant. Um, as far as getting, I wouldn't even call it buy-in, um, you know, I, so I've, I've written training manuals for physicians for, for McKesson, for pharmaceuticals. Um, I have found, my experience, I work very well with medical doctors. There's not a lot of argument with the stuff that we're talking about. It's not like we're taking the, the, the most contentious aspects of cannabis and telling them, no, 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 it cures AIDS. It's, it's not like that. So it is very mechanistic. It's, you know, in the States, it is getting, it is, to answer your question, getting much more accepted. Um, I haven't had an argument with a single doctor ever in North America. Uh, so literally, I've had patients in Colorado that bring in their list of medications, and I say, talk to your doctor, but I would remove this one, this one, reduce this one, and they come back the next day and said he did exactly that. So I am finding this absolutely integrates. It's just starting to with traditional medicine. Uh, I'm a part of opiate reduction studies in Canada, um, and we have seen a 75% reduction in overall opiate use with the introduction of, can of, of cannabis, 50% elimination. And other studies have shown 60, 65, and again, I briefly explained the mechanism, but it is absolutely a substitute, a viable substitute for addictive opiate medication. So as you mentioned, me medical research is necessary to have acceptance by the people and by the, the doctors, right? Correct. So Correct. how is the medical research going there in states and Canada? Is it supported by the government? Is it by the business? And so That's a good we, question. Yeah. So right, right now that is something that there is a push for is to have you know, your prescription reimbursed by the government if that's your, is that the question you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I see that as being far off in the states, but I think it's something that's probably pretty imminent in Canada since it is federally legal. So, you know, I, I, again, I really think the products are, will dictate this. If a doctor knew that he was going to get the same one-to-one -one THC CBD ratio at 10 milligrams of each, you know, they'd be much more comfortable prescribing it. But right now, we've got this 200-fold difference from one person to another combined with all these different products and different ways to get them into your, your, your system, and it, it's, it's a difficult thing to, to, to manage. But it is absolutely getting accepted. So what's your idea if we start producing THC in Greece would that uh, medical research would be necessary also to be conducted in Greece? So, you know, the, the, the states have just started a, a research license. So instead of, you know, cultivation, processing, uh, retail, they now have a research license. And the idea with that is that you, 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 you are participating in, in medical research. What I was putting up there before is I'm trying to get people to do it in a little bit more of a mindful way, um, as we are, which costs significantly less and is significantly more valuable, as you indicated. Yes, when you publish this kind of stuff in peer-reviewed journals, cell science nature, it's unequivocal. Right? And that's where it needs to be. And unfortunately, in the United States, because it's federally illegal, universities don't want you on the campus with it. They feel like they're going to jeopardize everything. Um, and in Canada, we still have a little bit more social stigma to get, to get past. So it's just this is where the industry is. But all very good questions. All right.
So the presentations are actually really, really amazing. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is, medical cannabis has been, you know, it's been going on for years and years and years. But now uh, using cannabis in food products and vaping and stuff like that, what sort of market size do you see that is in, in, in US and in Canada at the moment and across the world? So it's a good question. Um, the product that is absolutely here to stay is the vape pen. There's no question that's a hit. It's a hit with soccer moms. It's a hit with, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a discreet way of, of self-titrating. Um, so the pen is not going anywhere, in my opinion. Um, there, and, then, and then you really, then this is why it has to be sort of thought through based on the market you want to target. If you want to gain, uh, say, the, a more elderly population, gain their, their, their favor, um, it can't smell like cannabis, but it can't look like cannabis. And we find that lotions and salves go, they sell very well with, with, with uh, older populations. Um, but I think what you're looking at, depending on the market, you might have 5%, 5%, 5% with some of these. So the, the vape pen, I would say, is a big one. Always having quality flour. I mean, I, 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 even though I'm a processor, I can't stress it enough, flour will always sell. Um, and the beverage. I mean, I, I, I wish I could tell you some of the groups I'm working with on these. I mean, they're, they're the largest deals on the planet. And it's, they're not terribly complicated to make. And, and so some of the IP that I evaluate is all in the line of, of beverages. And so beverages, lotions, vape pens. Vaping, okay. Well, in terms of vaping, I mean, I'm, I'm selfish, actually. I've just bought a uh, cannabis vaping myself. Um, in terms of vaping, CBD, I mean, you've been coming from the research world. What is, have, has there been any research done on it? What is the impact of it? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of research that's done. I mentioned the non-physiological doses. That's a common thing with cannabinoids, with terpenes, with everything. Most of the work that's published is currently synthetic cannabinoids. Synthetic cannabinoids. So these are either just slightly changed, so a pharmaceutical company can patent them, mm -hmm. but it completely alters the pharmacokinetics. So if you've, I don't know if you've heard of SPICE or K2, these, these things here. So in the States, some of these cannabinoids that were manufactured, there's, I don't know, less than 100 that was shelved because it wasn't effective, found its way into over-the-counter products. <laughs> And we actually had people you know, die because in some cases these synthetics will bind irreversibly to the site. So you, you, it's not just changing a methyl group, it's absolutely uh, impacting. So the reality with that is the phytocannabinoids are very different. And you know, as simple as it is to have THC and CBD and make your various ratios and see how the cells respond, a lot of that still needs to be done. Okay. So Excellent. thank you. Oh, just to add to that, I just thought, so I just wrote an article, I write for Terpenes and Testing magazine. I wrote an article in the last issue on how to interpret science because, you know, everybody reads something and then it's true, right? And so that's not the case. You read something in the newspaper, it'll have the original citation. You don't have to be a scientist. Click it, see what the journal is, cut and paste it, put it in, 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 in Google and look for the impact factor. It's between you know, 0 and 36, I believe. And if it's two, three, four, maybe not. If it's cell science nature, 30, yes, it's accepted by the scientific community. Um, moreover, if you uh, go take the title of the journal and put it, of the article and put it in Google Scholar, it will give you the number of citations back. That also is an indicator. Something that's been cited a couple hundred times, you can be pretty comfortable. Something that's in an arcane journal and cited twice, that kind of thing. So there are ways to really start appreciating the quality of science without understanding it. Great. Thank you all very much. Sorry. Uh, on behalf of Helamco, I would like to thank you, Stephen, for this excellent presentation. I'm coming over from Vancouver or somewhere else, I'm so far. Uh, let me speak in Greek. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την παρακολούθηση. Είμαι ο εκπρόσωπο τη Χελάμκο. Συνεργαζόμαστε με την Πρέσκο, την εταιρεία που έκανε την παρουσίαση. Το περίπτερό μα είναι στο 7 και 8. Αν κάποιο θέλει οτιδήποτε στο χώρο του εξοπλισμού για τη φαρμακευτική κάναβη, από το, 0 μέχρι, από το Α μέχρι το Ω, είμαστε στη διάθεσή σα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ.